Welcome back to The Deal Room. And I've been reading a lot of press recently that's been very negative about Nike. And Nike is a company I somewhat have an affinity to, very fond of. Uh, small fact, I was once sponsored by Nike, Stephen. Can you believe that? <laughs> wow. Um, that's a story in itself. Let's well, get yeah, into that. But, uh, many moons ago. Uh, but yeah, Nike's been getting a bad rap. Their business strategy has been questioned. Their share price has been hit really hard recently. So I just wanted to get what's gone wrong at Nike and, and cover that a bit more. And I know you're an expert in all things strategy. And then HSBC restructuring. I uh, read news articles this um, this recent few sessions about them looking to streamline some of their sector coverage. So any of those interested in investment banking, that would be a good segment to listen to. And then also in the tech world, can't go an episode without at least mentioning AI a few times. Microsoft are leaving the open AI board. Why are they doing that? What does that mean? Are the regulators coming? I'm sure Stephen will explain. And then a little bit of private equity at the end. So stay tuned. But Stephen, how are you doing? Yeah, good. That was a bombshell. Sponsor. I actually had at the beginning of my notes, note to self, ask Ant how many pairs of Nikes does he own? So I'm <laughs> going to start with that question. Then we're going to get onto this sponsorship. This is this is interesting. I, I used to resell them, the Nike shoes they used to send me at school. Yeah. So I, I was in my final year of high school at this point. So we had gone on a European tour playing for England and we had all been sponsored as a team. And so we used to get sent like packages, like big sports bags full of gear fairly frequently um, would be great. Yeah. And I I just coin it all off for school and make a little side hustle because we used to get like running shoes as well as basketball shoes and kit and everything. That is unbelievable. What a, what a, what a side hustle to have at that age as well. Fantastic. <laughs> how many, so how many pairs do you own now though? You know, now, back in the day, I can imagine you were, you were all over Nike, um, but what about now? It's a good question because uh, I have, I have, let's say, several, uh, mm. all of which are predominantly trainers I never wear and wanted to buy when I was a kid but couldn't afford it. They're all Jordan related, uh, if I'm honest. Um, so I'm a bit of a s sneaker fiend uh, at heart. But actual day to day shoes, oh, I'm gonna have to say I wear Adidas most of the time. <laughs> Well, this is it. And this is part of the problem. You are part of the problem. And and this and, and we're going to talk about Nike's strategy and and why it's fallen out of love or Gen Z might have fallen out of love to an extent with Nike. The millennials are still into Nike. And I still, you know, look, my running trainers are Nike. I've got a couple of pairs of casual Nike trainers, but the only reason is because they fit me really well. I don't really care about the style, as you can probably tell. <laughs> but uh, let's get back into uh, let's get to let's get to this story. So I think most people that are listening would have some idea of Nike's backstory. Uh, if you haven't read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, please do. It is required reading for anyone that's interested in business and strategy. Brilliant, brilliantly written and, and, a, and a fascinating story. So the founding story is that Nike started by Phil Knight importing Onitsuka Tigers, uh, now ASICs, from Japan because there were no good running trainers um, and Phil Knight ran track in the US. So it's, ha it's got quality and athleticism right in its DNA. One of the coolest facts that I was reading about was the, the cost of the iconic swoosh logo. How much do you reckon it costs for the brand agents to come up with that logo and for that to become probably the second most iconic logo after the Apple logo? What, How much originally or what? what originally, it back in the 90s. <laughs> oh, it would, yeah, nowadays a lot, but back in the 1970s, what do you reckon? Oh, it's going to be something ridiculous. Maybe he didn't even pay anything. <laughs> $35. Oh, yeah. Close. $35 for the swoosh. <laughs> And that's not that's pretty good value for money. It's such an iconic thing. Um, and it was part of Nike's almost unparalleled rise to where it's at today from the 1960s when it started all the way through to the 2010s. It was a bit of a juggernaut. The bad news was limited largely to working conditions and supply chain and there were a lot of issues there that have subsequently been somewhat cleaned up but never were the issues financial 
And it just seemed like Nike was going from strength to strength to strength, signing the right athletes, whether it was Jordan or Tiger Woods or whoever it might have been, and getting that right level of innovation to feel like it was still the main player in town, certainly from a sneaker perspective. So fast forward to today and what has happened. So this was a, a news story that broke a couple of weeks ago, but it's been rumbling on Q1 earnings from Nike. Absolutely disastrous. So for the first time in its history, well, for the first time in its history, sneaker sales are down 4% year on year. Revenue is down 2% year on year. This is unheard of for a company like Nike. And as a result, the investment community, they were already slightly jittery, just sold 20% down on the day. In fact, this year alone, they're down about 32%. S&P 500's up 18%, by the way. <laughs> so if you're an active fund manager and you've got Nike as a significant part of your portfolio and you're benchmarked against the S&P 500, you're, <laughs> you're in for a really, really rough H1. So its share price are being depressed and its financials are, are, are stuttering. And I'm just looking at I'm just looking at some of the financials from their Q1 before we get into maybe some of the strategy. And obviously, the most interesting part as we come on and talk about strategy is that pivot that Nike has made away from wholesale customers and towards Nike Direct. So this is moving away from selling in stores like Foot Locker or Sports Direct or whatever it might be. And, and only selling through its own channels. It's high street stores, which are great, are great places to visit, but also through its app and through its website. So between 2018 and 2023, the wholesale customer revenue only increased from about 24 billion to about 27 billion. That's five years and barely any movement on the grand scheme of things. Yet sales through Night Direct doubled from about 10 billion to 20 billion. Um, and the Q1 earnings report has just compounded that because Nike sales through Nike Direct have stopped growing. So it's okay when you pivot and the thing that you pivot into is showing double digit growth. And you're like, well, look, this is a bit of a success. But when that thing that you pivot to stops growing and you realize that you no longer have that presence with your sports directs and your foot lockers and your macy's then you're left with a massive hole in your growth strategy so it's not a particularly good time to be a nike investor and i thought i would um i thought i'd summarize the strategy with four four strategic missteps so should we go for it yeah hit me all right so what's gone wrong firstly wrong leader so <laughs> Nike has been known for having very, very stable leadership. I think the previous CEO before John Donahoe came, came in in 2020 was there for 16 years. Phil Knight was obviously there for a long time. I think they've only had four CEOs in their history. But in early 2020, Mark Parker resigned and John Donahoe came in. Now, John Donahoe is not a sneakerhead. <laughs> He's not an athlete. He was an ex-executive at eBay and PayPal. And he was there kind of to shake things up a little bit, right? To go, look, early 2020, we need to think about our technology strategy. By the way, we've seen this play out before. <laughs> Disney, we've spoken about previously on the pod. It's a bricks and mortar plus media company that's trying to become a tech company. Nike took that same approach by hiring Don Donahoe, who is not an athlete, which is a very, very big departure from, from their base. So... Although in the first couple of years, 21, 22, during the coronavirus uh, pandemic, John Donahoe was seen as a, a really good choice. Look, everything's going to be bought and sold online. You've got experience. We're going to start measuring key performance indicators such as daily active users and launching the Night Run Club. And this is all going to be very exciting. So right place, right time. But as shoppers have returned to the high street, and by the way, they have done, there was expectations that they might not return. They very much have returned to buying things physically, in particular trainers. As shoppers have returned to the high street, this strategy is starting to feel like an apparel and sneaker company trying to be a tech company. 
And one of my constant refrains from a, <laughs> from a strategic perspective is that not everything needs to be tech. You can have brilliant companies, whether it's Costco or Walmart or whatever it might be, that are just great companies. They don't have recurring revenue, but that's fine. They're still good companies growing at double digits. So first strategic issue, definitely there is a sense that the leadership is wrong for this stage in Nike's growth. By the way, the leader still got the backing of Phil Knight. So he is the, 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 the kind of uh, overarching archbishop of Nike. So that's good. Secondly, so you, uh, I wonder yeah, then on that point, I wonder how far that backing from Phil Knight goes, because if the share price is down, not 30%, but in context of the benchmark, 50%, I mean, it's been hammered. And so surely by backing, you're sticking to the strategy then. Yes, uh, Phil Knight is, is backing the strategy. So, and he's saying, look, this will come good. Mm. Give it time. It's still a great product. We're still innovating. I'm still excited about the company. And I don't think that, although the share price has had a bit of a battering, I don't think that this is, you know, they're not pivoting away from trainers or away from sports, <laughs> you know, so, so there's still a direct line, a direct lineage back to the founding story. But there's definitely been calls for the reason why it's gone wrong. Number two, wrong strategy. So I've spoken previously about this move to direct to consumer, D to C. And this happened really, really quickly and quite shockingly in 2020 and 2021. There are a lot of headlines saying, look, Nike's just pulled out of another wholesaler, whether it was Macy's, Urban Out Outfitters, Zappos, Big Five Sporting Goods. They were exiting these relationships and focusing on D2C. Now, in theory, that's a good thing. If you're D2C, direct to consumer, you take more of the margin. You don't have to pay the, the seller fee, the wholesale fee. But what, what started off as a good strategy is turned on its head. Because as consumers have come back to the high street, these stores, Macy's, Urban Outfitters, Zappos, etc., haven't just sat around with empty shelf space waiting for Nike to come back. Yeah. They filled it with a bunch of upstarts, right? So Hoka or Hoka, the uh, thick, sold tra running trainers on running, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And obviously, Adidas with the Sambas and New Balance with the nine, uh, 990s. There's a lot of trainers that are filling that shelf space. So by 2023, 2024, when Nike realized, hey, wait a minute, we've got a slightly busted strategy here. Let's knock back on the door of Macy's. Well, Macy's will say yes, because it's Nike, but there might be a slightly smaller amount of shelf space to stock those trainers. So this is, a, this is a really important piece of strategic advice. When you are making a decision, you've got to think about the magnitude of that decision and the reversibility of that decision. If it is reversible and small, then make that decision very quickly. If it is not reversible and big, that is, you know, that's a transformational decision. And this is one of those transformational decisions that's starting really, really to hurt Nike. Okay. So leadership, wrong leadership, wrong strategy. And then thirdly, macro conditions. And, and you can't necessarily blame Nike for macroeconomic conditions, but it is obviously extremely reliant on a well-functioning globalized supply chain. And what ended up happening during the post-corona world as supply chain issues started flowing through the system is that Nike stockpiled its trainers in order to get over these supply chain issues, which ended up resulting in, I think it was $9.7 billion of inventory needing to be sold in Nike's warehouses. So they kind of did the right thing by stockpiling, but then they had to get rid of $10 billion worth of inventory and they just cut off, cut off all of their major wholesale relationships so then they started discounting maybe flooding the apps a little bit more it started becoming not that exciting slightly premium product that we all that we all love but actually a little bit of a discount product so macroeconomics certainly haven't helped although again other companies will have had exactly the same and managed to increase uh, their market share so macroecon uh, macroeconomic conditions number three and then finally, upstart competitors. And again, 
I don't necessarily think that this is wholly a Nike issue. When you are that synonymous with a market, when you have effectively made the market and your market share has hovered around 35 to 37% of the trainer market worldwide, it is so much easier to be an upstart than it is to be the incumbent. And yes, there are, there are some analysts saying that Nike looks a little bit tired. It's not really reinventing itself. Uh, it's just adding new colors to existing sneakers. There are more innovative athletic shoes out and about. That's true. All of that might be true, but it's just really, really hard to stay on top when you've got the likes of On Running, Lululemon, Asics, Brooks, Oka, all coming into the mixture and picking up some market share because they're new and a little bit different. I think the derivative point of that is its collaborations. And we spoke about this at the top of the podcast. Do Gen Z know who Jordan is? <laughs> I know it would, it, would, it would pain you to think this, but Jordans that are so exciting for people of our generation and Tiger Woods, how exciting. These aren't, these aren't the people, right? And they're now working hard to try and find those next superstars in order to collaborate with, to create the next Jordan. They haven't really found it yet. They're paying big bucks for a lot of uh, endorsement rights, but they haven't quite hit that Gen Z nail on the head. Yeah, there's there's definitely like, yeah, even Tiger Woods left, right? So when I think Nike, I think Serena, Tiger, mm. and Jordan, in terms of, but they're all, yeah, aging. <laughs> they're all aging and, and leaving, and there's definitely a, a space to be filled that hasn't quite got filled yet with the global superstars of, of, of our age. I just want to finish this last strategic point, which is a little bit of, uh, a little bit of analysis on, on running. So in the time where Nike is flatlining and actually slightly decreasing its revenue, on running, released its annual report a couple of months ago, 55% year on year revenue increase. EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, margin of 15.5%. Its direct to consumer revenue is up at 38%. And year to date, remember Nike's share price is down 32%, on running share price up 37%. So what a time to be, it's so much more fun being an upstart that's trying to claw market share than being the big beast on top that's just trying to preserve. And I think that's, that's kind of what we're seeing here. So yes, strategic missteps. Yes, this move to tech, B2C hasn't really worked, but there are some bigger forces, both macroeconomic and market-based forces that are probably limiting the double digit growth that we might expect to see from Nike. So the Nike CEO calls you up, Stephen. What, what are you doing in response to this? Well, they've already done the right thing. So they're, they're cutting some costs, which is good. Um, they have hired a 30-year Nike exec back out of retirement to reestablish the relationship with wholesalers. And they are really, really going hard at the endorsements. So they gave, I don't know if you've heard of Caitlin Clark, was oh, the number one pick, <laughs> number one pick in the uh, women's NBA draft. Massive twenty-eight million dollar endorsement contract. Obviously, they won the Nike um, endorsement, uh, the Nike foot sponsorship from the German football team for the first time in seventy years. Adidas being a strong German brand, so it's not all doom and gloom. I think they're doing the right things. I think they need to pull back from thinking that this could be a tech company and definitely focus on going back to, all right, what are the best trainers that you can possibly make endorsed by the people that really, really matter culturally at the moment? Mm. Okay, so we've got three more kind of areas to cover, uh, about five minutes a piece. So let's go straight into the HSBC story. Yeah, so this one's a quick one. And I think it's just building on our collective knowledge, anyone that's been listening to the pod over the last few months, building on our collective knowledge of what the investment bank looks like. So kind of take your strategy Nike hat off and then put yourself in an investment bank. So the, the headline is that HSBC has reshaped its investment bank to look a little bit more like its rivals. So this 
We've spoken a decent amount about different divisions within the investment bank. And one of the main areas of an investment bank are its sector coverage teams. Now, if you type in list of sector coverage teams on Google, you are probably going to get 16 or 17 different coverage teams, everything from metals and mining to transportation to shipping as a separate uh, as a separate area to healthcare to consumer to retail to tech. Now, what re HSBC is doing is it's winnowing its sector teams down to five larger groups. Now, these five larger groups are kind of monoliths, right? So they've got the technology, digital and financial services group that captures a pretty large swathe of the world of companies, consumer, healthcare, and retail. It's a mega group. Resources, industrials, and energy transition, real, real assets and services, and then the private capital group, which is an interesting fifth limb to those five groups. And what HSBC is doing essentially is, is A, streamlining. It's quite a good opportunity for there to be some selective redundancies or nice see you later retirements. So slightly focusing on costs, but also they're just copying their rivals. And that's no bad thing, by the way. So City did something very similar and has these super sector groups, technology and communications, another which covers healthcare, consumer and retail. So this is a trend that's going on across investment banks. And in some industries, it's really good to be different, right? In some industries, you want to be an outlier, you want to be innovative, you want to offer something that your competitors don't. In the world of investment banking, it's not a bad thing to look quite similar to other organizations because you're offering a relatively standardized service. You want a potential client to meet two similar looking teams and decide which one of those two banks you're going to go for. So in this case, I don't think it's a bad move. And by the way, I think HSBC in this kind of cost cutting rationalizing exercise is probably preparing for a world of falling interest rates, i.e. lower profits as it goes into, as it goes into this, hopefully interest cutting environment. Well, and then I know you, you mentioned to me offline about BNP, the French bank. Is they some way tied into this narrative? Yeah, I just wanted to tag BNP to the HSBC story because they're similar banks, actually. You know, big global banks, probably more on the commercial side than on the investment banking side. But the headline, I don't know if you saw this, the BNP Paribas has signed a strategic deal with Mistral, the company that I reckon we probably referenced four or five times on this podcast, it's not bad for a company that's got about 100 employees or whatever the number is that we referenced last week. So this is a partnership and it's super, super interesting. So BNP Paribas, big uh, global bank, universal bank, high street, lend, uh, high street banking, wealth management, investment banking, et cetera. They're now using Mistral and its large language models to develop a number of use cases across Custom, customer support, sales, IT, and other areas, including algorithmic quantitative trading, creating new strategies out of Mr. L's large language model. And just to take a very quick step back, if we, a few months ago, we spoke about the different strategies of these AI upstarts. And Mr. L's strategy was to, be, to, was to build large language models that were suitable for heavily regulated business cases. So it wasn't the free, maybe the freewheeling, you know, let's get everything in there of, 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 of and let everyone use it of open AI. They were saying, look, all right, we, we've got this capability and we want to deliver it to governments, defense and banks. So from my perspective, this is one of the first examples of Mistral putting its strategy and putting its business model into action. And I'm absolutely fascinated to see where this goes. Really interesting to see whether BNP Paribas, as maybe one of the first banks that has aligned so closely with one of these startups, I don't think I've heard another one announcing such a big uh, strategic uh, engagement.
Yeah, and it's interesting because BNP is someone I don't think you think of immediately when it comes to technology and, and finance. But, uh, you know, as a post I put out earlier this week about on the in the FX department in the in the in the market side, they are the gold standard in algo trading on the sell side institutions. And it was talking about um, this Rex platform they have and how they are improving efficiency, the cost base, client interactions becoming low touch, being that they've got these sophisticated individual it's, they're so cool. Viper is one of them, uh, Iguana and Chameleon, and they're a toolbox. And depending on your trade that you want to execute, you just go to, and the algo immediately calculates the most optimal solution. And then you can trade via the algo, which is unusual because you're putting it in the client's hands to execute the trade. So you have zero touch. It's all technology led. So it's highly efficient. It comes with certain downsides. But yeah, it's interesting because BNP seem to be and on the algo space, they're they're running fifth generation algo models now, and they're award winning. They're the gold standard on the sell side, which is something you probably might not think of when you hear their name against others. Yeah, that I mean, that's really really interesting, and and definitely one to cover on your your Friday podcast because my the limits of my knowledge will quickly be reached. But again, just to go back to the Nike point, so Nike trying to be a tech company, it works to an to an extent, but people still need physical shoes. BMP trying to be a tech company. Well, none of this stuff is physical anyway. So if we can do that better, cheaper, and at a higher quality, then this, this sounds strategically really, really interesting and very exciting. Mm. Okay, so Microsoft and, and Apple as well, and OpenAI were in the news. Why, why was that last week? Yeah, just to build on from our mistral, we're going we're gonna to drop OpenAI again, as we tend to do. Uh, most most episodes at the moment. I wonder whether, by the way, we'll look back at this run of episodes in a few years' time and go, well, that was obvious that we were speaking about these two companies or these three companies. Or will we go, gosh, what a storm in a teacup. I can't believe yeah, we all yeah, bought into that the bubble. That was the top, the top of the bubble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe someone could be tracking the podcast to to track bubble tops. But anyway, um, so this is a this is a continuation story from some of the stuff that we've discussed over the last few months. Now, remember, these big tech companies are so large that if they were to make significant acquisitions, Competition and Markets Authority in the UK and the FTC in the US would definitely have something to say. And when a company buys another company, they have a right to opine on that transaction and block it. So very, very cleverly, the likes of Microsoft and Google and Amazon and Apple trying to figure out how to get around this control point by, instead of acquiring, investing. Instead of acquiring, effectively buying or effectively employing all of the staff of a particular company, as we, uh, as we discussed a few weeks ago. So they're trying to create all of these different scenarios where the FTC is not going to come looking, not going to come sniffing. And obviously, we know the value that has been added to Microsoft as a result of its tie up with OpenAI, $12 billion, $13 billion of investment, resulting in well over a trillion dollars worth of market cap gains, albeit not directly. So, in, re in response to increased regulatory scrutiny, both sides of the pond, Microsoft has dropped its board observer seat on the OpenAI board, and Apple has chosen not to take up a board observer seat whatsoever. By the way, just stepping back, a board observer is someone that gets to sit, uh, gets to attend board meetings, but they are not officially a director of a company, uh, of the company. So a board observer doesn't have the liability, doesn't have the legal recourse that a director would have, but gets the strategic input of sitting in on the board meetings. It's quite a nice place to be. But anyway, Microsoft and Apple have pulled back, and this is because. In the words of uh, the law firm uh, Foxglove's Corey Crider, big tech know that they're in a cat and mouse game with antitrust enforcers over artificial intelligence. So this really is very, very interesting. And the EU's weighing in and looking at the $13 billion of investment, specifically looking at the exclusivity clauses between Microsoft and OpenAI. OpenAI has to host its models 
on Azure, for example, is that anti-competitive? Is that closing off the market? Yeah, this is this is this is going to be rumbling on for years and years and years. And quite frankly, the stronger the regulators get across all parts of big tech, I think the better. The better for startups, the better for consumers, the better for the marketplace. Bring on the regulation. That's what I say. Oh, Trump will set <laughs> to that. Don't you worry, Stephen. Yeah, I'm a bit worried about that. A little bit worried <laughs> about that. But 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 I do think it will it will it will release creative energy. I think if you think about it, you know, 30, 40 years ago, if you're a technology company, or maybe even 10 or 15 years ago, if you're a technology company, your ambition was to was to IPO and become a big technology company in your own right. Nowadays, if you're any technology adjacent company, your ambition is to get bought or to partner with a big tech firm in order to, in order to maximize your value. I don't think that that's right. All right. Well, look, private equity one to finish. What do you have? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stand me down from my regulatory hobby horse. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk about, we'll talk about clear late capital group. Now, the reason why I want to talk about this is because in part we like putting a little private equity bit onto most episodes, but this is a really interesting article. So this is uh, the article that's titled the end of cheap money era catches up the Chelsea FC's owner. So Clear Lake Capital Group, the owner of Chelsea Football Club, who spent billions of dollars buying and then wasting money on football players, they have about $80 billion of assets under management. So think about that in the context of KKR, it's you know, you know, well over 500 billion and Blackstone, it's top to trillion, but it's been growing extremely rapidly. And what is important about this story is they grew their funds. So they've got six funds. They're about to raise their seventh fund. Funds sit below the overall firm. The first f- fund was raised in 2009. It was a $415 million fund. But in 2020, they raised a $7.1 billion fund. A year later, they raised a $14.1 billion fund. So suddenly, within 18 months, they've got $21 billion that they need to deploy. They need to start investing. It's not, you're not a good private equity firm if you just raise money and then don't call on that capital ever. So they've got to go out and invest it. What was going on in 2021, 22, 23, or early parts of 23? Huge, huge valuation bubble. Therefore, and I really, really like the way one analyst puts this, the vintage the vintage of buying of buyouts in 21 and 22 is going to turn out to be a terrible vintage, liking it, <laughs> like in it to, 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 to wine growers in France. It's going to be a terrible, a terrible vintage because you bought at too high a price. And what's happening is that there's a lot of debt that's in these companies that is looking pretty close to the stress levels. I sent you a little chart of some of the price cents on the dollar of some of these, some of these um, companies that are owned through these different fund structures of Clear Lake. So again, could Clear Lake be the canary in the coal mine of the excesses, raising too much money too quickly, deploying it too fast, bad valuations? And now as they're looking in 24, 25, 26, they start to sell on some of the 21, 22 vintage, they're now going, oof, all right, this isn't as good as we thought it was. These are potentially distressed companies or certainly distressed debt within companies. And are we going to be able to offload these? The sneaky point, by the way, as we, as we finish this piece, the sneaky point of a lot of these private equity firms is that they've started creating continuation vehicles, effectively a new funds owned by Clear Lake that acquire businesses that are held by a previous fund in order to provide liquidity and exit for the original fund's limited partners, but it's still held, it's still held by the company. So eventually, I like, you know, the pass to parcel analogy works very well. Eventually the music's gonna stop and someone's gonna get someone's gonna get there, you know, someone's gonna get very burnt. Yeah, gonna, my daughter wants to come in with her Jenga blocks. So we should play a little game of <laughs> Jenga here. Should we pull a few out, see how we go? Yeah, yeah. The, well, look, all the analogies end with the music stopping or the or the tower falling over or something like that. So again, 
let's let's we're going to stay on this story there's a lot of these stories that are coming up again and again which is really good from a from a student's perspective that is trying to keep hold of the four or five bits of information the four or five stories that they need to have a decent view on as they go into an interview or go into their job all right good point and on that note we will wrap it up and we will see everyone next week thank you Stephen. thank you man